here's the thing it's amazing the last like the last four or five testimonies have been about provision and here's another one chris what has the lord done for you this year i can't believe you're making me follow that yeah i know me too i gotta follow you so so why don't you bring it down a notch and help me out all right thanks (laughs) um so for me um i got let i got laid off in january for my job oh great that's Um, the month we were fasting yes isn't that nice yeah so the the a few months before that, I started looking for jobs, and um, honestly, I got no, no hits really last year, very few. Um, and then the Sunday before I got laid off is when it really clicked for me, the, the difference between hope and faith. Um, and and I just really, it really just changed my whole outlook. Um, and then the week before, so the, the following Monday, sorry, from Sunday, so Monday, I started getting hits left and right. I started getting recruiters contacting me, um, and it was pretty awesome. That is interesting. Wait a minute. I'm going to interrupt for a second. So one of the things I was teaching was that we usually hope and pray. But Jesus said, what did he say? When you pray, come on church, when you pray, believe. believe. Say it again. When you pray, believe. believe. Don't hope, believe. The hope is what you're hoping for, but believing... And you, you made that connection, and the very next day you started getting these calls. I started getting those calls, yeah, the very next day. Awesome. And then that Friday I got laid off. So it was like, everything's awesome, I'm really excited, and then all of a sudden, boom. Satan comes immediately. Yeah. We've got we to gotta learn these things, you guys. When the seed is sown, Satan comes immediately, right? Mm-hmm. And you've got you to gotta be good ground and hang in there, and you'll bear 30, 60, 100 fold. Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, my wife and I got together and started talking about, okay, well, if we're going to be looking for another job, you know, what do we want? What's the most important things? Um, and my, my hours were crazy. The stress level was high. Um, it just wasn't good for my family, things like that. So those are the things that we were looking for, more time, more flexibility, obviously more money. Um, and so the search started, I uh, started getting hits all over the place. I got, um, jobs that were twice as much as I was making before, um, you know, executive level positions, things like that. Um, and so I started, started going for those. But, the time, but they were in New York. Well, yeah. They so were in Colorado. All over the I place. I prayed against them. Sorry. Thank you. Appreciate that. No, but, but they weren't going to give me what we wanted as a family. So um, amazingly, even though I got great feedback from all these jobs, they, the doors started closing. And the only door that really was left open is the job that I currently have. And just to take a step back... I originally got turned down for this job that I, that I got. Uh, they said I was overqualified. They weren't going to be able to pay me enough. They weren't going to be able to keep me, you know, excited and, and working there. Um, and I just felt compelled by the spirit to send an email back saying, because I just felt like something was wrong. You know, that I was like, this isn't right. I have to reply. So I sent like a three-paragraph uh, essay <laughs> and explained why I was perfect for the job. Anyways, long story short, uh, more money, better time with, you know, more time with my family, better hours. Perfect. Everything's awesome. Woo! Awesome. I am uh, really looking forward to laying this word into our hearts today. I love Easter season because we get to turn away from peripheral secondary things and look straight at Jesus. He's the beginning, the middle, and the end. And so... Let us just drill down and focus on Him. So let's pray and and let's sincerely ask the Holy Spirit to reveal Jesus to us all over again or in a deeper way than we have right now. Jesus, we love you. Holy Spirit, we are asking you and expecting for you to reveal Jesus to us. We know you you would not leave us spiritually blind because that's not who you are. You are the revealer of Jesus. So, Holy Spirit, reveal Jesus to our hearts this morning. Don't let these words just be words. Let him be a voice in my voice that touches our hearts, the voice of God. In Jesus' name. I want to ask you a question this morning as I open today's message. How do you know that someone is your friend? How do you know someone's your friend? I want you to answer me. This isn't rhetorical. How do you know if someone's truly your friend? Just say some things. They listen to you. They pray with you. Consistency. They're there in the hard times. They, they fight with you. 
and for you. They're not judgmental. They tell you the truth. What's that? They would die for you. Now, you know where I'm headed. And you just stole my, my punchline. As though I could hide it anyway. It's like, oh, Jesus died first? I didn't know that. A true friend, friend is if they are truly there for you. See, you can say you're my friend, but we really don't know that, do we? Until our friendship is tested. How many of you ever had a friendship tested and then you found out they truly weren't your friend? Just raise your hand. Come on. Yeah. And that hurts, doesn't it? That, that hurts. I remember one time uh, when I was pastoring in East County, something tragic happened uh, in my life. And social norms said that I was supposed to do a certain thing. But God told me to do just the opposite. You ever been there? And literally my world was cut right down the middle. Our church was about a thousand plus people. And it was like half the church thought I should. They were shooting on me. I should go that. I should do this. The other half was saying you shouldn't. The pastoral staff was down the middle. My personal family, mom, dad, brothers, sisters, right down the middle, getting phone calls. You need to do this. It's the right thing to do. Others saying, don't do that. You need to do this. I was worn to a nub with anxiety about what the heck I should do. And the Lord told me what to do. And I knew that half my world was going to think I was a very irresponsible, mean, bad person for not obeying social norms. And the Lord said to me, your world is on fire and you can do nothing about it. But when it's over, you'll know who your true friends are. And what shocked me was those who were not my friends when it was all said and done and those who were my friends. It was amazing that some things that some people that I didn't agree on certain things with this politics, with theology, whatever, and you just think, you know, we're, we just don't gel. After you go through the fire, it's amazing how they were able to recognize, well, one, my heart and my intentions. They just believed in me. And majors and minors were shaken out and separated. And then those that you think are going to stick with you through thick and thin are calling you jerk on the way out the door. Anybody ever experienced what I'm talking about? Something like that. Yeah. So, so how do you know someone's your true friend? Let me ask you another question. What would you do for a friend? What would you do for a friend? Go out of your way to help them, give them a ride when it's out of the way. What about if it's way out of the way? How about giving, how about loaning them money? All right. How about loaning them money and you know you're never going to get it back? Okay. How much? Where's the line? Would you stand with them when they are falsely accused, even if it would cost you your own reputation, guilt by association? Would you stand with them when they are rightly accused, and it's going to cost you your reputation for standing with somebody that everybody else hates? Friendship's deep. You see, a friend steps in when everybody else steps out. A friend's with you in good times and bad. A friend shares your sorrows and cries with you and celebrates your joys and is never jealous of you. They're just genuinely happy for you. Even if their prayers have not been answered, they're so happy when yours are. I went to a workshop. Well, I did a workshop this last week. I was doing a social media workshop. And I had four high school teenagers that were on my, working with me on the panel. And I asked them, how many friends do you have on Instagram? Oh, 2,000, 1,500, 2,500. Yeah, and I'm sure every one of them would take a bullet for you. You guys are tight, I'm sure. You know, I don't know if you remember this movie, um, Tombstone, based on a true story. Wyatt Earp, Doc Holliday. Wyatt Earp, righteous lawman. And Doc Holliday, a notorious gunslinging criminal. And yet, Wyatt Earp just found it in his heart to love and befriend this criminal. Nobody else would. And he even even risked his life. He walked out in the middle of a creek and took on an entire gang protecting his guys who 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 were trapped 
on the other side of the bank. And Doc Holliday, dying of tuberculosis, joined him to wipe out this gang. And, and he just, he loved Wider so much because he believed in him. Their friendship was so deep. Here's a quick scene, about a minute long, right after this shootout in the river where this righteous Wyatt Earp risked his life to save his men, including this notorious criminal, Doc Holliday. Listen to what Doc Holliday says about Wyatt Earp. Did you ever see anything like that before? Hell, I ain't never even heard of anything like that. <laughs> Nothing. Where is he? Down by the creek. Walking on water. Well, let's hope he's got another miracle up his sleeve. Let's find no Ringo. He's headed straight for us. If they were my brothers, I'd want revenge to him. No, make no mistake. It's not revenge he's after. It's a reckoning. Doc, you ought to be in bed. What the hell are you doing this for, anyway? Wide up is my friend. Hell, I got lots of friends. I don't. I just love that scene. You know who it reminds me of? Pastor Mark. <laughs> that just came to my mind. Because listen, if you ever heard Mark's testimony, it's amazing. He hated Christians, but he went to this Bible study and he cussed and he smoked and he hated Christians so much they made him sit in the kitchen while they had Bible study. They would let him come, but he had to stay in the kitchen because he was so disgusting and distasteful. Finally, the wives of the guys running the Bible study said, if Mark keeps coming, we're not coming. And they said, no, he's coming. And we're keeping this Bible study because that's what Jesus would do. One day, Mark says he was driving to his Bible study, and this overwhelming feeling came over him, and all of a sudden, he realized what it was. He said, I love those guys. I really, really love them because they befriended me when nobody else would. And he came into the Bible study, and he said, guys, I had this amazing revelation on the way here tonight. He said, I really love you guys. And they said, we really love you too. And do you know that Bible study, it began a church that he ended up being the senior pastor of? (laughs) Isn't that awesome? Oh, you don't want to hear the rest of the story. Why do do you think he's here? Yeah, they shipped him to the United States. You see, not all friendships are the same. Some are deeper than others. You got to wait and see what you go through and if you're truly there for one another. Let me ask you this. How far would you go for a stranger? Would you give your life for a stranger? What about a criminal, a known criminal like this? What about a sworn enemy, somebody who has despitefully used you, mistreated you, manipulated you, lied about you, offended you, offended your wife, offended your children, stole a job from you, an actual enemy, someone who hates your guts and someone that you hate when you think about them, would you die for them? Look at the book book of Romans says, Romans 5. When we were utterly helpless, Christ came at just the right time and died for us sinners. Now, most people would be willing to die for an upright person, though someone might perhaps be willing to die for a person who is especially good. But God, everybody say, but God. But God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us when we were still sinners And since we have been made right in God's sight by the blood of Christ, he will certainly save us from God's condemnation. For since our friendship with God was restored by the death of his son while we were still still enemies. Wow. We will certainly be saved through the life of his son. So now we can rejoice in our wonderful new relationship with God because our our Lord Jesus Christ has made us friends with God. I think this is the greatest picture of friendship in the history 
of the world. This picture about to come up here. Now, you might find it strange that I'm teaching on friendship in the context of Jesus sacrificing himself for us. But this is what he said. He says this in John, 13, John 15. There is no greater love than to lay down one's life for one's friends. He even did it for those who were driving the nails into his hands and his feet. You know, we can criticize Catholicism because they're fixated on Jesus on the cross and we're fixated on the resurrection and victory. But I think we grossly miss something when we don't meditate about Jesus, our friend, laying down his life for us on that cross. We certainly want to live a resurrected life, but we certainly don't want to forget what it took to get us there. This is where our worship comes from. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says it this way. It's just so profound. May the Holy Spirit help our minds grasp the reality of this. For our sake, everybody say, for my sake. Come on, say it again. For my sake, He, God, made Him, Jesus, to be sin who knew no sin. We can't even imagine what that was like for Him. So that... In him, we might become the righteousness of God. Now, some say, well, he didn't actually become sin. That's taking it just a little bit too far. Well, then I would have to say, then you and I didn't truly become the righteousness of God. It wasn't symbolic. In this verse, we see what makes Good Friday so good because the picture of Christ on the cross does not seem like something good. What makes it good is this word called imputation. And that is, that is, on the cross, God imputed your flawed record to Jesus so that he could impute Jesus' perfect record to you. On the cross, God treated Jesus as if he had lived your life. And he treats you as though you had lived Jesus' life. John Stott says it this way, the essence of sin is that we substitute ourselves for God. We put ourselves where only God deserves to be. That's the essence of sin. But the essence of salvation is that God substitutes himself for us. God puts himself where we deserve to be. That is the essence of salvation. So the axiom is this, Jesus' act of substitution plus God's act of imputation equals our reconciliation with God. And the way to receive this grace is to not just believe it happened, but believe it happened for you personally and receive the payment personally from your friend, capital F, Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Now, you may think that, again, that this is kind of strange putting what he did into the context of friendship but that's what he calls it, the act of a friend. And I love this essence of friendship. For me, I think friendship is the deepest love there is. Even couples who've been married for like 100 years, like Gary and Kathy Mancini here. They've known each other since kindergarten. They've been married. How many years have you guys been married? 46 years. I guarantee, yeah, amen. I guarantee you they would tell you that the core, the essence of their, of their marriage is a friendship. After all the butterflies are gone and all the fatuation is gone, what do you have? Your life partners, you're walking together through thick and thin, and you do it for 46 years, you are friends. Jesus called Abraham his friend. It's the greatest compliment you could ever get from God, to say, he's my true friend. Would you be crucified for a friend? Some of you can't even sit through an hour and a half church service. I mean, seriously, I think you could be crucified for a friend. That was supposed to be funny. I put that in there. I thought you guys would laugh, but that didn't work. Okay. What kind of friend is this that Jesus would do this for us? 
the best friend you'll ever have. Jesus saw that you and I were in eternal trouble with no way out. I mean, the, the measure of a friend is, I am in deep trouble. How much trouble? The depth of the measure of your trouble, and then the depth of the measure that your friend sacrifices to get you out of trouble is the depth of your thanksgiving. Recently, I have someone very dear to me that got himself into an unbelievable hole that he could not get out of. And my wife and I dug deep, and we said, let's help this, let's help this person. It's going to cost us, and we're going to have to recover, but we love this person, we've got to help him. And this person was so distraught, literally, it's like they couldn't even talk. They were trying to figure out, what the heck am I going to do to get out of this hole? There was no way out. And I went up to the person, I said, listen, this is what my wife and I have decided to do for you. And when I told him, literally, he involuntarily threw himself at me and grabbed me around the neck so I, like I could barely breathe. And he said, thank you. You just saved my life. And immediately in my mind, I had this flash that if we truly had a grasp of what Jesus Christ did for us, that is how we would be responding to him. What would you do for a friend? Would you give a kidney? Would you give a lung? Blood transfusion? Could you imagine President Trump giving a kidney for Nancy Pelosi? Can you imagine Al Sharpton giving a blood transfusion to a member of the KKK? He said, well, that, that's kind of weird and extreme. Hey, that is shallow compared to what Jesus did for you and me. We've got to get a hold of this thing that we call salvation. And who did it for us? The spotless, sinless Son of God. Traded places with you, Al? Can you believe that? You're not friends with somebody who dishonors you. You say, well, I'm not the enemy of God. Well, the Bible says that they that are friends of the world are enemies with God. James even writes to the Christian church. He says, because you love the world and you, you live in habitual sin, even after you're saved, you've become God's enemy. In other words, there's some people who purposely want to hurt God. Then there's people like maybe a teenager in the home that is just rebelling against the parents and want to go their own way. That independence is like there's, a, it's like there's animosity between you and them. That's what he's saying, that we're enemies with God. We want our independence. We don't want to submit to God. We don't want anybody to tell us what to do. That's why the universe told us what to do. The universe made this happen. Well, you see, we still want to believe that there's something supernatural out there, but we don't want to personalize it because then we'll be responsible to obey him. And so we make it all kind of loosey-goosey and new agey so that it's not personal. But here's what I want to say. Or wait, and some, sometimes what we say is this. Either sin doesn't exist, the concept is just in your own mind, or it's really not that big of a deal. Or it is that big of a deal, but we try to pass the buck because we don't want that stink on us, right? The Adam syndrome. The woman you gave me. You got to get that guilt off of us and get it on somebody else. I didn't do it. The kid's running through the house. You're something break. Who knocked that over? Not me. Not me. Not me. It's like somebody knocked it over, huh? Not me. It's like, isn't that amazing? Those darn invisible mice that keep running through the house and breaking everything. Here's what I want to say to us today, family of God. Unless we understand the grossness of our sin, we will not understand the greatness of God's mercy. If we're trying to get the stank off of us and we come up with this theology and this new age concepts that sin doesn't exist, sin's not real, sin's not a big deal. Oh, really? Well, if it wasn't just a big deal, somebody should have told God because he slaughtered his son on the cross to set us free from the penalty of sin. That's a pretty big payment for a small deal. And I just like to say, somebody's preaching today. Listen to this. My sin is no big deal. That equals his grace is no big deal then. Which means Jesus' sacrifice was no big deal, which equals very weak worship. You understand what I'm saying here? The depth of our understanding 
of the grossness of our sin magnifies the greatness of his mercy. That's why I like to say, my sin is a big deal. Therefore, his grace is an even bigger deal, which means Jesus' sacrifice is the biggest deal, which creates deep thankfulness, which is our worship. Rather than minimizing our sin by denying it, let's maximize his grace by confessing it. Don't be afraid. Oh, I like that. That was heaven. That was heaven affirming me as I preach. I want to read. Now, some of you here today may feel like maybe you've sinned so badly that you're kind of like on God's B plan. Let me tell you something. There's no B plan with God. God has an A plan. He keeps restoring you. His mercies are brand new every morning. Don't let the devil tell you you're on God's B plan. He's on God's F plan. And he's just trying to pull you down with him because he's a liar. The truth is, no matter what you have done, Jesus' blood is enough. And your faith in Jesus' blood equals forgiveness and the joy of God's presence every single time. Now listen, I'm going to read a whole psalm to you this morning. Just fasten in because we're going to actually read the Bible this morning, an entire psalm. And it's a psalm King David, the greatest king Israel ever had, wrote a song that he wrote after he committed adultery and first-degree murder to cover up his adultery from one of his own soldiers. His soldiers are out fighting a battle. David stayed home instead of going out with the, with the, with the army like the king's supposed to. He stayed home. He sees a beautiful girl from his palace. He tells the servant, go get her. He has sex with her. She gets pregnant. He says, uh-oh, what am I going to do? Calls the soldier to come home, wants him to go home so that he can have sex with his wife. Say, oh, it's your baby. The soldier was so loyal, he says, I will not go home when my brothers in arms are not at home with their wives. I'm going to sleep out in the street. So then the next night, David got him drunk. Said, hey, maybe if I get him drunk, he'll go home and be with his wife. Guy still wouldn't do it. So David says, you know what I need to do? I need to send him out on the front lines, tell the captain, tell everybody to pull back and make sure he is killed. And he did it. This is the man after God's own heart. You see, we're all the same. We're a mixture of sinful desires and gratifications and holy desires and a pursuit for Jesus. We're all a mixed bag. Thank God for God's mercy. Can you say, thank God for God's mercy? Just go ahead and say it right now because I know you're ready to pop. You've got to say it. So he thinks he got away with it. And then the prophet comes in and busts David, and David writes this song. How happy and fulfilled are those whose rebellion has been forgiven. Those whose sins are covered by the blood. How blessed and relieved are those who who have confessed their corruption to God. For he wipes their slates clean and removes hypocrisy from their hearts. Before I confessed my sins, I kept it all inside. My dishonesty devastated my inner life, causing my life to be filled with frustration and irrepressible anguish and misery. Anybody ever felt that before? See, here, here's the, here's the um, quandary with giving your life to Jesus. Before you come to Christ, you really have no conviction. There's no, like, there's no witness on the inside of your heart other than your conscience, but it's not like that thing that really bothers you. Like when I was a freshman in high school, I went to an all-guy Catholic high school, and I was probably the best center, at least, at least competing for the best center in the entire high school. And we went to chapel where you go behind the door one by one with the priest, and then you confess your sins. And I'd never done this before. I was raised Catholic, but I was under a pile of six other brothers and sisters and grandmas and grandpas and aunts and uncles and all these rituals and things you do, and I just couldn't keep up with it all. And so then I'm I'm thrown into this, this high school, and they're all going to confession, and I didn't know what to do when I got back there. Everybody assumes you know what to do, you know, but nobody really told me what it's all about. I just kind of went through the motions. So here I am. I go behind. I'm sitting there with the priest. He's the principal of the high school, Father Pillay, and he said, John, 
So, what sins have you committed since the last time you were in confession? I sat there and thought, and thought, and thought, and thought. Now, you remember, I'm one of the worst kids in the high school. Like cleaning urinals and stuff, and mopping the cafeteria floor. I mean, they were punishing me often. And you know what I actually said? With, with all honesty, I said, None. He literally laughed out loud. He could not believe it. I had no conviction. The Holy Spirit wasn't in me. And then he said, well, just say three Hail Marys and we'll call it even. I couldn't even do that. He had to help me. He's probably thinking, dear Lord, this poor soul is going straight down. But after you come to Christ, it's, it, there's, it's, a, it's a war. After you come to Christ, your conscience becomes sensitive to sin. Which is why if we do not have a massive grasp on the grace of God, you feel worse after you got saved than before you got saved. Because God has circumcised your heart. He's pulled back that stony heart, that callous heart, and he's given you a tender heart and you're sensitive to God and to truth and to your own sin. You grieve the Holy Spirit. You can feel it which is why, family of God, we've got to be in touch with the mercy and the grace of God so we can stay sensitive and free all at the same time. Let's keep reading. The pain never left, let up, for your hand of conviction was heavy on my heart. What a gift that God would press down on us until we confess it and get it out of us. Confession cleanses the soul. Denial doesn't. Look, you can say you don't smell, but everybody around you knows you do. Call it what it is. When I confess my sins to God, I don't do a general thing. I say, this is exactly what I did. This is what I said. This is what I thought. It's not like a newsflash in heaven when you tell them. It's like, oh, you did that? What you're doing is you're being honest with God and with yourself. And that's where cleansing and freedom comes from. The pain never left up for your hand of conviction was heavy in my heart. My strength was sapped. My inner life dried up like a spiritual drought within my soul. Pause in his presence. Then I finally admitted to you all my sins, refusing to hide them any longer. I said, my life-giving God. I like that. I will openly acknowledge my evil actions. And you forgave me. All at once, the guilt of my sin washed away and all my pain disappeared. Pause in his presence. This is what I've learned through it all. All believers should confess their sins to God. Do it every time. God has uncovered you in the time of exposing. For if you do this, when sudden storms of life overwhelm, you'll be kept safe. Lord, you are my secret hiding place, protecting me from these troubles. Surrounding me with songs of gladness. Your joyous shouts of rescue release my breakthrough. Pause in his presence. I hear the Lord saying, I will stay close to you, instructing and guiding you along the pathway for your life. I will advise you along the way and lead you forth with my eyes as your guide. So don't make it difficult. Don't be stubborn when I take you where you've not been before. Don't make me tug you and pull you along. Just come with me. So my conclusion is this. Many are the sorrows and frustrations of those who don't come clean with God. But when you trust in the Lord for forgiveness, his wraparound love will surround you. So celebrate the goodness of God. Show this kindness to everyone who is his. Go ahead, shout for joy all you upright ones who want to please him. What a great song, huh? And you can't write that if you have not sinned and found God's forgiveness. Now in closing, I want to go one step deeper with this. Early on in my walk with the Lord, even though I knew His forgiveness, even though I could teach on His forgiveness, even though I would confess my sins, there was still something deep down inside of me I could not articulate, I could not define it, that put up this kind of like a, like a steel wall almost to where I just could not 
tangibly connect with God. I felt myself pushing and performing. I found, my, I found myself, even though I confessed my sins, still feeling dirty and awful. Even after I would confess and I would walk away. It's kind of like when you get your car worked on. And then they take the old broken part out and they show it to you. It's kind of like you, you take that part with you and just throw it back in the engine. You don't do that. You leave that nasty, dirty part right there in the mechanics. But I was having such, such trouble. You know what it was? it was? It was the emotions of the sin. It was the emotions of the dirt. Do you know what that is called? And this is what I want to close with in the next five minutes. Some of you are going to get delivered in the next five minutes. Because I had to fight for this. And now I know what it's called and I want to tell you about it. And we're going to break it today. It's called shame. Shame is the emotion that trails along with guilt. It's deeper than guilt. Guilt says you've done wrong. Shame says you are wrong. It goes down to the core of your identity. And so there's something seriously flawed with you. And do you know what the truth is? There is. We are flawed. We are broken. We are in desperate need of repair, restoration, and wholeness. And that is what God is all about. But shame just comes along. And it's that committee in your head that's constantly criticizing everything you do. The way you pray. You didn't read enough. You didn't pray enough. You didn't fast enough. You didn't give enough. You didn't witness enough. That's shame, shame, shame. That's not the voice of Jesus Christ. That's what I learned. And that's what broke the shame in my life. I'm going to show you five sources of shame. And then we're going to come against this. Five sources of shame. One is original shame. You were born with it. We were born imperfect. That's why we're always trying to climb to be perfect. We, we feel it. We know we fall short. The Bible says we've all fallen short of the glory of God. That's where perfectionism comes from. That's what that is. Excellence is beautiful. Excellence is I want to do my best. I want to use every ounce of my talents, my gifts, my intellect, my passions for God. But excellence doesn't cr- just sh- shame you when you fail. It just says, oh, man, then you learn from that failure so you can do better next time. That's a spirit of excellence. But a spirit of perfection shames you when you make mistakes, you fail, you sin, and says you're you're pathetic. That's the voice of shame. It's not the voice of your Savior. Remember the woman caught in adultery? This is the next one. This is actual shame. You sinned and you carry the shame of it. They, she was literally caught in the very act of adultery. They bust in the room. There she is. I don't know why they didn't bring the man to church, but they brought her to church, and they throw her down to the feet of Jesus right in the middle of a church service. What a bunch of mean religionists. They don't care about her. All they want to do is trap Jesus and using her as bait. And you know the famous saying, which I, by the way, said in my Catholic classroom and study hall i didn't know i didn't know i thought it was funny i'm sitting in study hall and the priest is up there at the desk and the room is full of my peers and i said i got a joke and i said yeah one day and i told the story and jesus said he that has never sinned throw the first stone and also the stone comes through the crowd and bam hits her right in the head and jesus says oh mom I thought it was funny. All my friends are like, oh my gosh. And I was cleaning urinals and I was washing the cafeteria floor for the next week. Jesus says, they that have never sinned throw the first stone. And he says, where are those who shame you? She said, they're gone. He says, I don't shame you either. Now, come on, don't do that anymore. Follow the light of life. Jesus lifts shame from us. He does not put it on us. The third one is impose shame. That is someone sinned against you and you carry their shame like a woman who has been sexually assaulted and they say, well, you brought it on yourself. Your mom and dad get divorced and you think it's your fault. I wasn't a good enough child. 
other people who, through their behavior, shame you, and then you own their shame. That's imposed shame. Then there's societal shame, a people group, a person, a place that is associated with shame. Like you think of, you know, you go to Germany. They do not want to talk about the Holocaust. They do not want to talk about Hitler. Don't even bring it up. Don't even talk about it. It's just when you think of Germany, of course, there's many things to think that are wonderful, but they have societal shame from that horrific time in history. There are people groups and places that you associate in your mind as soon as you hear them. Then there's perpetual shame, and that is you pass your shame on to your kids if you don't break it. Peter had to break shame. He denied Jesus. Paul had to break shame. He murdered Christians. David had to break shame. Adultery, first degree murder. Moses had to break shame. Murdering an Egyptian and burying him in the sand. All of them had to break shame to go on with their destiny. And they did. One didn't. Judas. He was so riddled with shame for betraying Jesus that he went and hung himself. And shame is telling some of you that you deserve to be spiritually hung and you actually have a noose around your neck. You still come to church. You still maybe read the Bible. But the shame has told you that God is grossly disappointed in you. Shame on you. And you don't need to tell shame. Shut your mouth. My friend Jesus not only died for my sins, he died for my shame too. Boom. I practiced that for about six months. I'd literally say it out loud. Shame, shut up. You're not my savior. I am only obligated to listen to the voice of Jesus. So are you. You are only obligated to listen to the voice of Jesus Christ, not the voice of shame. Look at the Bible says in Hebrews 12. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great a cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. Josh, we come on up. And let us run with perseverance the race that is marked before us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Jesus experienced societal shame. They called him a they called him an illegitimate child because he was born out of woodlock. They said he was demon possessed, a deceiver of the people. They spit on, they beat him, they whipped him, they crucified him. They hung, they hung him naked at the crossroads, like front and Broadway downtown, right there for everybody to see. The Son of God bore societal shame for you and I. And you know what the word scorn means? He spit on it. He ignored it. He thought of it as nothing, not even, not even enough to give it his attention for the joy that you and I would be his one day. You need to let your pursuit of God be your passion. And when you fail and shame tries to dog you, ignore it. Ignore it. If you sin or when you sin and you feel that shame, that's okay. That's a warning signal. That's a gift from God. Otherwise, you're a sociopath. If you feel no sorrow or remorse or guilt when you sin. But what I'm saying is once you come to him and do what 1 John says right here. But if we freely admit our sins when his light uncovers them, he will be faithful to forgive us every time. God is just to forgive our sins because of Christ. And he will continue to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. I'm going to ask the ushers to begin passing out communion. I want you to tell shame to shut up this morning. I want you to do what the psalmist did. And if you have a residual of sin in your life right now, you have something that you feel guilty about, shamed about. Maybe you have a habitual sin in your life right now that you keep turning back to and you feel like I can never break this. Today is your day of deliverance because the power of Jesus' blood and his grace 
And the presence of the Holy Spirit right now can break that. It's happened to me before where I've asked the Lord sincerely. I remember sitting in a chair in my bedroom saying, Lord, I'm asking you to deliver me. And I felt like a breeze, literally. I felt like, and it was gone. The desire was gone. It was amazing. That can happen to you this morning with sincere repentance and faith that your friend, Jesus, paid it all. Shame and all. He bore it on the cross. As the communion is being passed out, Josh is going to play the song. I want you to meditate on your friend, Jesus, what he did. Own it all. And then let's receive communion together with deep gratefulness and thankfulness.